Moving on, it is finally time to talk to a dentist. Not because I lost a portion of my upper jaw when I was 14 and I now have fake front teeth that I only sometimes take care of, but because it's time for the regular portfolio segment in which I talk to everyday people who are no experts. They don't have thousands of years of experience and stuff like that. They're not here to sell you anything. For some reason, they just thought that it was a good idea to spend half an hour talking to me. Maybe they hope that they'll bring some sense into me. And um, so far, nobody has succeeded, but I have had two great conversations. And if anybody who's watching this feels like they want to be part of the segment, you want to sit down with me, chat on, on Zoom and discuss what you invest in and why, please do reach out through email. It's Antonio at resourcetalks.com or on Twitter or down in the comments below, whatever. Uh, come at my door at two o'clock and not just kidding, don't do that. Unless unless you're bringing a couple of steaks and you can come. But do reach out if you want to be part of the series and uh, I'll gladly sit down with you and talk. Um, yeah, let's listen to the dentist now. All right, Steve, you're a 39-year-old and you're living in Oklahoma. How do you get by? Uh, you know, I think most people, uh, myself included, are just trying to keep their head down, try to stay ahead of inflation. Um, yeah, I, I think most people, um, like you and I enjoy resources. We enjoy, you know, uh, studying economics and history, right? We have that in common. Um, that's not normal. I don't think, I, I think most people are just, are just getting by and, and trying to look after their family and, and just doing the day to day. Okay. But yeah. Um, so you study economics for fun. What do you do for a living? Oh yeah. Uh, for a living. Uh, I'm a tooth fairy. I'm a dentist. Yeah. 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 I knew that. And, um, I'm probably going to insert <laughs> some, some kind, some kind of a joke, about my, my fake front teeth. So I, I sustained ah. an injury when I was 14. So uh, long story yeah. though. Tell me how much a dentist and how much do dentists in uh, in Oklahoma make a year? Uh, anywhere from probably sixty thousand to to four hundred thousand, and I've I've hit both of those before. Um, and it 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 can really range wildly based on whether you're an associate or an owner, um, and kind of just your area how the how the regional economy in your local area is doing. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's pretty wild. Um, wow. the the swings. So, how much mm-hmm. how much was your degree though because if you're making 60 a year your degree was probably more than that right it was unfortunately a lot more than that yeah so uh college i had scholarships for most of it um and my parents helped me with the rest of it so i didn't have any debt from college but uh i think college would have cost about 40 grand um and then you have to have a, a uni degree right and then you go on to dentistry um, in my class, I had the least amount of loans. I was, well, one other guy and I have like the, there was a class of 60 something of us. Right. Um, and the student loans that people took out ranged from, I was 155,000 and I was on the tied for the least. And then one guy, I think took out 480,000. Wow. Is he ever going to pay that back? No, I think he was expecting to default. And I think, I think he might've used some of that money to like help buy a house, which is, is illegal if the, if the tax authorities here catch you, but he, I think he got away with it. So, (laughs) so what do you, what do you, as someone who sort of knows that side of the, of the system, but it has not been heavily in debt. What do you, what do you think of the, the loan forgiveness thing in, in the U S now? Man, I've seen a lot of bad takes on that lately. I... <laughs> just like initial thoughts. You're, you know, you're not a yeah, I, just like, you know, you know, I, I, I worked really hard and I saved up really hard to start paying those down. And I haven't even paid all of mine off yet, right? But I paid it down faster than I would have had I thought, oh, I could get it forgiven. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I hurt for the people that thought they were going to get a good degree and then didn't and then couldn't ask for a refund, you know, or couldn't really quit. It's so like I can see the point of wanting it forgiven, realizing that you got conned into a worthless degree that's not monetizable or not helping you help society in a, a meaningful way. Like, but I, I really feel for all the people that like I almost worked for our military or one of the local Indian agencies to pay down my debt. And I would have given four years basically of indentured servitude, um, not making anything for myself. Um 
you know, and I, I didn't do that, but I know lots of people that did do that, yeah. you know? And so like, it seems really, really callous to, to all those people that, that paid their own way um, with either their money or their parents' money or by working in indentured servitude for four or five years to pay it back. Um, so yeah, that's, it's just a really broken system all the way around. <clears throat> yeah. You're making me feel very lucky because you said you were on a scholarship and then you yeah. went like a hundred plus grand in debt. And yeah. I was on a scholarship in, in, in college and yeah. I got paid to study. It's not a lot, would, but a hundred. That sounds about, great. Yeah, but I I got about six hundred um, total because they, they sort of two scholarships. There's a government one and and a school specific one. I got about you can equate it to about six hundred euro a month, right. and um, college was a hundred and forty euro per year. Um, that's also because my parents were were really poor, so they were below the poverty line when I started college. Sure. So, but now you're talking about like half a million in, in debt. Like, you know, I cannot, even, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to have that much money in my life, mm. uh, let alone pay back that much in debt and then build a net worth or then, you know, save up for your right. kids college. And like, right. how do you make it work? So yeah, talking about kids, I, I heard something in the background. So I'm assuming you have two <laughs> little girls. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I knew that before, but uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. So, what percentage of your of your income goes to your investments? Like, do you, I, you, you know, you're a, you're a business owner yourself, but have you fixed that at like, okay, twenty percent always goes aside or something among those lines? Yeah, no, and that's that's actually something that like you asked me if I had advice for people, and that that's actually something I, w- I would advise is uh, keeping a percentage, keeping a budget that does right, um, and. There's a really great book I'd encourage everybody to read if they haven't already called Pay Yourself First. And it talks about how to work and how to pay yourself through your work and how to to make sure that you get the first 10% to incentivize yourself to work harder. Um, And it's just kind of a a mind trick you can play with yourself. I think it's in The Richest Man in Babylon too, um, Mm. that theory. And it's all, it's actually in the Bible too. And in, in Proverbs, it talks about how you don't want to muzzle the ox while he treads the grain. Um, like you should pay your workers immediately. And, and you know, it, t- it talks a lot about what's fair and what's, what, what things you should incentivize uh, in the Bible as well. But um, yeah, paying yourself first and budgeting is a big thing. Um, right now, because my, my income has been so variable, um, then I, I'm kind of at the point where I budget differently. I don't, I don't necessarily make it a, uh, a percentage right off. Like the first 10% goes to a tithe, which is another, there's a, a great book called the treasure principle. I would encourage people to read. It's about charity and, and charitable giving and how if the first 10% you give is charitable, then <clears throat> your life is going to change. Right. Uh, and I, I won't go through the whole book right now because it's like, I don't know. 150 200 pages but it's a, it's a fin- it's easily one of the best books i've read so mm. uh we, we do that the try to get 10 percent or more you know charitably away um immediately um but after that because my my expenses have been so variable with kind of the inflation that we're all feeling um especially as a business owner um our you know our gloves have gone the gloves that we have to wear to, to examine somebody have gone from just a 12 cents a pair they went up briefly to about a dollar a pair and now they're back down to oh, about 60 cents a pair. Um, and so we've had, a, we've had a lot of supply chain disruptions just run our costs wild. And so that's, that's made my take home pay as a business owner, you know, very, very variable. Um, so now it's just kind of like, well, food goes first, mortgage goes second, you know, and then, the necessities go first. And if I have anything above that, then, okay, now I'm going to put that towards uranium or I'm going to put that towards some investment I want to make. So it's painful, you know, hearing you talk about your, your margins dropping like that. Cause you're a, you're a service business. Your margins should be way up, Um, you know, way, way higher than, for example, what I do in in, the restaurant business, as I was telling you, it's not really a great business. Um, but the general rule of thumb is that you make fifty dollars or fifty euro for for every one thousand that you do in revenue. So, mm-hmm. 
margins are not great. Um, but yeah, I hear you there. How long have you been at it for? Like how long have you been investing for? Um, it's, it's been, I was kind of raised with it a little bit. My, my grandfather, you know, sort of talking to me about it very young, uh, about compounding interest, compounding and investments, compounding. Um, so I had some investments, you know, since single digit days, but they're very small. Right. Um, and actually cashed them out to study at a, a university in Europe for a little bit. Um, so I, w- I wiped them out and went to zero in my early twenties. I think that was a good investment in myself, like investing in my education. Hmm. Uh, um, but investing my own money about 12 years. Okay. Yeah. Good. So you started yeah. early. Yeah. You're um, about my age, I guess. 39. Yeah. I had a calculator probably come up with 27. So 27. Yeah. That's yeah. About nice. Nice. Did yeah. you start out in natural resources or have you just recently? Joined? No, um, no, uh, natural resources. I mean, they've just been getting murdered the last, most of the last 10 years. Right. Um, I actually, um, I was talking to Sprott because once they turned the money printers on here and they started out sending PPP loans and stimulus checks and, and all this other stuff, um, my way, my understanding of history at the time was, well, it won't happen immediately, but this is going to lead to Weimar hyperinflation, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that that was, you know, I'd read Thomas Sewell and, and a bunch of other uh, economists and, and studied history. Um, and so that my, my first thing was like, oh, you know, eventually precious metals will be the thing, right? Because our fiat system's collapsing. So I, I didn't get started with natural resources until February or March of, of 2019. Okay. I mean, I, I looked at them, but it wasn't something I wanted to invest in. So I, I wasn't hard into them. Mm. Uh, right. And everybody I'd known, like I'd known a couple of oil guys that had played the cycle well and become fabulously wealthy. Mm. Um, Oklahoma is an oil state. Yep. Um, but, you know, every farmer and rancher I knew, so the soft commodities, I'd been getting murdered for 50, 60 years, like in the markets, right? Ter- terrible business, terrible investment. Yep. I think that changes in the next 10. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm buying cows and stuff and uh, hoping to get a ranch someday with, but uh, as far as natural resources, no, I, I didn't, I didn't think it was a good place to be. Um, and actually the first, first thing I bought was cause Adam from okay. the COVID crash. <laughs> so wow. That's awesome. Dividend. Yeah. Yeah. Got lucky, better, better to be lucky than good sometimes. Sure. Um, is that like, is, is, cause what, what do you have now? You've got gold, silver, uranium. Mm, is that how much of your portfolio is, is that? Oh, uh, uranium's probably about 50, 52%. Nice. Um, so not the full Terry Papa new hundred percent, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's up there. You definitely feel the, the moves in the market. You're ruining my title. Now I got to put only 50%. Nobody's going to click on it. <laughs> I know. you could just put speculator barbecue a little bit of work <laughs> yeah yeah um, sounds decent what else yeah uh, precious metals is probably another 30 percent um titanium and nickel um titanium what, the what's rest. the story there it's really <clears throat> it, it's kind of you know so it's an industrial metal play um but kind of the same story as, as copper or uh, even uranium, like there's a constant demand and we've had declining ore grades um, and there's really not been any good discoveries for, for decades and decades. And now there's one play and only one play and it's a very small market, right? Kind of like uranium, it's only 40 billion, titanium's even smaller than that, right? Um, there's really only one play um, and it's a, it's a fantastic discovery and it's in Malawi, which a lot of people don't want to go to because a, a country risk, you know? Um, but uh, it's, it, it's, you know, it's actually a, a tier one deposit, both in, and they call it rutile titanium uh, ore, and also graphite. Um, mm. And I'll just give the ticker at sovereign metals. I mean, 
I've, I've tried telling people about it and they just look at me like I'm weird. So, which is true. Um, so. Isn't the real skin titanium too? Cause that's what I'm finding here. They are, they are, but um, it is a dirty er titanium um, and it takes a lot of energy to refine um, and it is very low grade. Okay. Um, so okay. it's, it's kind of like, well, do you want to go to the Athabasca of titanium or do you want to go to, hmm. I don't know, Namibia or something, you know, it's like, <clears throat> and it, this titanium that they have can be actually cleaned and, and mined just with the open pit mining and then actually putting the dirt back. Cause you can just wash it with water and the titanium falls out. <clears throat> hmm. So it's very different, very different, very clean. <clears throat> Interesting. I got to look into this. You're making me, you're making me curious because it's smaller yeah. than uranium. So, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to try and I'm find somebody to talk to about. Is there somebody daggers. on Twitter? No. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> talking the about it? Of the company. I don't think so. And I, I kind of like plays that nobody are talking about. Like, I remember one of the first videos of yours that I watched was about fertilizer. And I think it was a trepid potash, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I thought, nobody's talking about this. Good on Antonio. Yeah, I'll have to look into this. And I, I didn't really take a position, but it's it's gone up really well. Neither did I. I was real I was I was on the cusp of doing it and it's it's done okay since oh it's done a five X since I talked about it. Well yeah. But I didn't take yeah. a position, so what good does that do to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I think I think intrepid potash actually rips again. I think it's putting in the bottoming pattern. Um Oh, at one point it had done uh, 12x, 11x. Yep. Wow. And now it's down 50% since then. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it's given a second entry to you and me. Um, but uh, the titanium I really like. Um, and there's a couple other small plays like that. Um, Altius royalties or origin royalties, like nobody ever talks about them. They don't have a marketing department really. It's just real smart people like Rick Rule and Adrian Day that that kind of buy it on quietly. And I was just going through some of their financial filings of those guys in particular. And I thought, okay, what are the smart guys buying but not talking about? You know, um, so, okay. I well, mean, you, I'll, just, you, I'll, I'll just get some of that. Based on what you're telling me, you're the smart guy. I mean, who does? I, I don't think how, so. how do you come up with that? I should be doing that. Uh, yeah. Good. <clears throat> what was the most recent stock you, you bought? If you don't feel, if you, if you, if you don't feel, oh, of course. Yeah. No, um, I bought two this week. Um, I bought a copy resources, which is an ISR play in uh, the United States, Colorado. Um, and it was trading at like 53 cents a pound or something. Um, and it's not been drilled for a long time because we've had a long bear market. Uh, but they've got about 50 million pounds. And then the other one I bought, I do talk a lot about 92 energy. Um, mm. And it was also on the Australian. So I don't think, you know, most that, that, that's a harder market to reach for most Americans and yep. Canadians that they don't feel comfortable going over there. Um, but 92, you know, they found that deposit before base load and their hits have been higher and wider and, and higher grade. Um, and I think they've, they've managed their capital well. Um, so and it's about half the market cap of base load. And I, I think it's the better better part of the deposit. Now, both of those companies have other properties that I expect them to explore in the next couple of years. Cool. Uh, th this particular deposit, nobody knows who has a better half of it. But so far, 92's had better hits. Um, and I got some at 35 cents the other day. So I was like, <laughs> it's hand tough. it to me. But I expect it to be, you know, several dollars. Nice. Very soon. Very soon. It sounds to me like you do have a lot of stocks, though. How many stocks are you holding? Over 120. Wow. Um, Why is that? What's the what's the strategy? Um, I kind of I I was at first I just kind of did the shotgun approach and I said, okay, you know, Sprott likes this one, um, and I actually gave some money to Sprott to manage, so um, I could kind of see what they actually believed in, like where they're going to put their money where their mouth is, you know. Um, and they've been they've been excellent advisors. They've done really well, saying, "Okay, this is." They'll they'll send me geological reports, and they'll they'll talk me through them if I ask questions, and they'll say, "Okay, we see the markets moving this way." So they've taught me a lot about markets and and geology and how to evaluate a company and their management and and stuff. Um, so anybody that you know is new to the space, I, I think you would do 
very, very well, especially on a risk adjusted basis, just giving you money to sprout and, and having them teach you about it. Um, so, mm. um, but I, I put some, you know, like different advisors um, that I knew that had done well in resource markets. I would just, you know, they said, okay, these are the 10 we like, and these are the 12 we like. And so I just put them with them. Um, and I did, you know, uh, <laughs> Rick rule has been on your show several times and, and he has said many times that, you know, you need to spend so much time per stock, right. If you're going to own it. And actually I was doing that and it just took up a lot of time. So I started pairing back <laughs> and I plan to pair back more, uh, when some of them rally a little bit. So, yeah. Here's a tough question for you then. Sure. You wake up tomorrow, there's a gun to your head and they say, sell all of your stocks so you can only okay. keep three. But you have to put all of the money from the other 120 or whatever that you sold. You got to put it all into three stocks. What do you What do? You do? I thought about doing that, actually. <laughs> Just because there's so few companies of the ones that I own where I've really been impressed with the management. Um, is there a holding? Is it, do I have to hold it for a certain amount of time? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Yeah, let's say let's say you do it three to five years. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> yeah. the uranium bull market, I, I don't know, lasts a full three to five years. I think it would get two and a half out of it, but I don't know that we get three to five. Um, so if I had to pick three, just no time constraints, they would all be uranium stocks. But I think I would probably just do probably sovereign metals, the titanium play. Um, because it's it's kind of like the era deposit of next gen, like it's just irreplaceable. Um, it has to be has to be built, and it's going to be very profitable. Um, I would do so. Sovereign Metals is, is SBM on the Australian. Um, Origin Re Royalties, um, probably is is a, it's a super safe play. I don't expect a lot of multiples, but um, they have a silver. Uh, royalty with First Majestic that's going to be paying really well. And I think it's a silicon royalty with Anglo Gold Ashanti in the US that's going to pay really well. Um, and they've got others in the pipeline too, but those are just the first two that I think make it really good. Um, I'd probably go out a little bit on the risk and probably do some Taurus Metals, which is a nickel sulfide play in Brazil. Um, and I, I think it ends up being just a monster, monster deposit, like like Arrow or Sovereign. I, um, it's not been proven yet, so that's that's a wild speculation along the heart. But I've seen enough data, and and I don't think nickel geology is quite as hard as gold and silver geology. And so I, I think <clears throat> I think that one, I like my odds of it being the Arrow of nickel sulfide. So big words. Yeah, say two yeah. two and a half years. What, what kind of returns are you hoping for in the uranium space? Um, uranium in two years. I mean, what what, what uh, do you need? What I, kind of returns do you need to make it worth it for you? I only need a three x to make it worth worth it for me. Um, do you think that's possible? Probable? Do you think it's probable? I think that I think in nine months we'll have that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think broadly you could just do the ETFs and probably get four or five X, um, sorry. And, um, I think mm, the better juniors, if you select a nice basket of juniors or if you, if you just hire Justin Hewn and follow his picks, um, something like that, like I, I, I think you're going to get more than 10 X out of it over the next year and a half, two years. So, but, you know, I also, you know, I, I think we have pretty high returns just in the underlying commodity itself. Like I think it goes not just to new all-time highs nominally. I think it goes to new all-time highs adjusted for inflation. Um, and probably well beyond that. Amir Nani said yesterday on, on the spaces that he expected $200 minimum, right? And, and contracting pricing is term term. So yeah. uh, is he talking his own bit? Yeah, the dude's a fantastic salesman, probably. But uh, I mean, I've I've thought that for a while, just because we're we're basically coming into a short squeeze, right? 
Um, so, hmm. uh, and you've, you've, you've had a lot of experts that are actual experts. I'm not an expert, but you've had experts come on and say, you know, we've had, we have the, the 1940s level of geopolitical tension, right? <clears throat> we have the 1970s level of energy crisis. And that, that's what caused those two bull markets. We have, we have the 2007 level of like kind of, oh, we need to diversify our supply and get security supply because Cigar Lake flooded. Now the, you know, between, between security supply and the underfeeding to overfeeding shift. I mean, we've got every one of those, you know, reasons that we should have a bull market and it should just be just completely irrational. Just, just a massive spike that that draws a bubble and draws FOMO money, retail speculation, momentum chaser money in. So, yeah, I, I expect big things, but I don't know I'll get them. Um, but that's that's my baseline expectation. <clears throat> that's your baseline expectation. Okay, very interesting. <laughs> I might, I'm probably a lot more conservative than that in my expectations, but I'd definitely be my, I'd be very happy with that. Yeah, and I don't. I mean, do I stay to five hundred? No, probably not. I, I think I probably get out. You know, in in small little five percent chunks. Um, but I, I definitely think we go above two hundred. 